right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday Assembly. See some uh, familiar faces and I see some new faces, always a pleasure. So my name is Anthony, I will be your host for uh, this morning and we're gonna have a really interesting time. So let's get started. All right, so welcome to the Sunday Assembly. Most of you are familiar with us, but in case anybody's new or just need a refresher, we are a secular congregation. We like to celebrate life because that's what it's all about. If you're not living, you're dying. So let's continue living. We have three very easy models to follow. Live better, help often, and wonder more. These are very important because we always want to live better. We try to do our very best these uh, troubling times, and we like to help often, which is very important these days. Wondering more is why we're here. We like to learn something new and it's always important to educate ourselves. Let's start off with a little magic trick. I know we're talking about Houdini today. We're not gonna be talking about his magic, but everybody likes magic tricks. I recommend everybody participate. Uh, it's gonna be really fun and easy. It's gonna require just a little bit of basic math and a little bit of geography. Think of a number between one and 10. Don't say it out loud, just think it in your head. If you're not very good with math, pick a lower number going to go give everybody a second to think of a number. Now multiply that number by nine and think of that number in your head. You should have two digits. Put a plus sign in between the two digits. So let's say your number is 32, put a plus between the three and the two and add the two numbers together. Last part of the math. Subtract five from your number. Now, if A is one, B is two, C is three, D is four, and so on, think of the letter that corresponds with your number. Now think of a country that starts with that letter. Okay, last part. Think of an animal that starts with the second letter of that country. Hopefully everybody has their number, has their uh, country and their animal. And I'm sorry, but there are no elephants in Denmark. Hopefully everybody uh, was on the same page with that one. Did everybody get that? I see some smiling faces, nods, good. All right, that's fun times. All right, so life happens every day. We always got something going on. Uh, we like to share, get some bragging rights. Um, I'll start off, you can do positive or negative. We don't discriminate. I'll start off with something positive. Uh, so yesterday I went out on my first video shoot of a sporting event since the beginning of November when we went into our second lockdown which is a good indication that life is truly getting back to normal, very slowly, but surely. It was a little bit uh, challenging with uh, everything that's going on, but that's life and we're getting back to normal. Uh, if anybody else would like to share something in their life, raise your hand, uh, uh, either on your screen or in the chat. All right, I see Victoria has got her hand up. Yep. Um, hi, I'm here from Austin's condo where I am um, by the end of the month going to be officially moving in. So congratulations. Our life happens. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see the full room right now because it's an absolute mess. I have so much stuff and I don't know where any of it will go, but <laughs> we're figuring it out. <laughs> Also, side note, if anyone wants to buy some furniture, <laughs> I have quite a lot that I'm selling. Awesome, awesome. Congratulations on the uh, cohabitation. <laughs> All right, uh, CJ. 
Hello. I have a non-cat uh, themed life happens this month, uh, which is that I got a new job that I'll be starting in a couple weeks and it's full time. So what more can you ask for in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> Well, do you want to share what the job is or yeah, is it like top to, secret CIA no, stuff? It's hard to explain, but basically I'll be helping uh, college students at Oakland Community College have like a support system so that they can finish their degree, specifically low income and first generation students. Awesome. Awesome. Definitely in the uh, help often category. Yeah. All right. Anybody else like to share? No, it's okay. All right, so moving on. Uh, we have a monthly reading and today it's gonna be from Admiral William H. McRaven. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors who at the time were all Vietnam veterans would show up in my barracks room and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. That seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough battle-hardened seals. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride and it will encourage you to do another task and another and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you wanna change the world, start off by making your bed. I think I always found those words to be pretty uh, inspiring. And I remember my parents always told me, first thing you gotta do in the morning before anything is always make your bed. Always make your bed. You don't have to take the socks off the floor, but make your bed. Now on to our main event, and I shall pass it over to CJ. Hmm. Nope. Hold on a second. Austin might need to do it since he's like the primary host. I'm trying to push it over so that you or there you are. So co-host. So we'll see how that works. Oh, now I'm co-host. Okay. Yes. Now I can share my screen. Okay. Perfect. Alrighty. So hello everyone. I will be talking about Houdini today and absolutely not covering his magic at all. So if you're interested in him as an escape artist or as a magician, there are plenty of books and movies out there and that is not what I'll be covering at all. <laughs> so to start with my discussion, we need to have a little history lesson just about spiritualism in the 1920s, specifically in America. If you came to my tarot card talk, we went over spiritualism in England for a little bit, and this is sort of an extension of that, but it didn't really hit America until the 1920s for three main reasons. First of all, World War I happened. There were a lot of people dying. Death leads people to want to explore something beyond death. Also, a pandemic happened, specifically the Spanish flu pandemic. A lot of people also died because of that same sort of reason. And there was also increased travel at the time between England and America. So there was a lot more exchanging of information and ideas and people were going around proselytizing spiritualism, essentially. To preface everything, this is a preface from A Magician Among the Spirits, which Harry Houdini wrote. And 
it covered a lot. Most of the chapters outlined specific mediums and how he had debunked them or got forced them to sign a confession saying that they were not real mediums. It's an absolutely wild book, which you can read for free. It's in the public domain. I highly recommend doing it. It's a really fun, weird read. Uh, but it has a short preface, which I think summarizes his views of spiritualism. And I think it's a good view for everyone to have. He says, gladly would I embrace spiritualism if it could prove its claims, but I'm not willing to be deluded by the fraudulent impositions of so-called psychics or accept as sacred reality any of the evidence that has been placed before me thus far. The ancient's childish belief in demonology and witchcraft, the superstitions of the civilized and uncivilized, and those marvelous mysteries of past ages are all laughed at by the full grown sense of the present generation. Yet we are asked in all seriousness by a few scientists and scholars to accept as absolute truth such testimony as is built up by their pet mediums, which so far has been proven to be nothing beyond a more or less elaborate construction of fiction resting on the slenderest of foundations or rather absolutely no foundation. Not only educated men and women with emotional longings for some assurance of the continued existence of departed loved ones, but people of all phases and conditions of life have completely surrendered themselves to belief in the most monstrous fiction vouched for by only a single witness of the so-called phenomenon. And that too, when the medium through whom the phenomenon was supposed to have presented itself had been caught cheating time and again. I believe in a hereafter and no greater blessing could be bestowed upon me than the opportunity once again to speak to my sainted mother who awaits me with open arms to press me to her heart and welcome just as she did when I entered this mundane sphere. As you can see, beyond being a good magician, he was a very good writer as well. Everything gets a little buck wild during this. So here's the timeline that I'm laying out so you don't get too confused when we speed through the wildness that is about to occur. So in 1913, Harry Houdini's mother died. His father was a rabbi. His mother was an immigrant uh, from Hungary. All of his family was from Hungary. Uh, that will be important later in the story. In 1922, he had a seance with Jean Doyle. Now, if you think the last name Doyle sounds familiar for this time period, it absolutely does. And it gets very weird. Uh, 1923, so the very next year, Houdini stopped traveling and doing magic and instead started traveling around the country lecturing about fake mediums and psychics. The year after that, he published A Magician Among the Spirits which was his long expose about spiritualism and all fake mediums. Two years after that, 1926, he testifies before Congress. And that fall, he dies in Detroit, Michigan. So there's a little Michigan connection there, an unfortunate one, but it's there. And then in 1936, Bess, who is his wife, holds the final seance for contacting Houdini. So let's dive into this wild world here. So Jean Doyle was the wife of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, famous author of the Sherlock Holmes novels. What a lot of people don't know because his estate has very, very well kept this part on the DL uh, was that he was also a huge spiritualist, uh, wrote several books about the existence of fairies and spirits. He, <laughs> He abandoned all rational logic after writing Sherlock Holmes, uh, but he was also friends with Harry Houdini. They originally met when, uh, right after Harry Houdini's mother died when he started investigating spiritualism because he wanted to talk to his mom because he was a real mama's boy in the best way. They were very good friends. He loved her so much. You can see in the picture with him and his mom and his wife, uh, they were very, very close. So when she died, it impacted him tremendously. And he set off trying to find a way to communicate with her beyond the grave. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle met up with him because he was one of the two major proponents of spiritualism in America who brought it over from England. And um, this is one of the books Sir Arthur Conan Doyle published, Phineas Speaks. Phineas was the spirit that supposedly communicated with his wife, uh, who was a medium. Uh, there was an incident in Atlantic City 
the seance that he had with Jean Doyle, in which she said that his mother was communicating through her to him, which is all Harry Houdini had wanted was to communicate with his mother. Um, he did find it confusing when the seance happened. Um, and she was like, I'm going to be doing automatic writing, which was a medium technique where basically you just hold a pencil, put it on paper, and then the spirit moves through you to write down something and its message. And you don't even know it's happening. It's just flowing through your fingertips. But in this letter, uh, she started off with the sign of the cross at the top. And he was like, hmm, weird, because my mom was definitely Jewish. Okay, whatever. Uh, then she spoke fluent English. Uh, Harry Houdini's mother had never spoken English in her life because she was an immigrant and never learned English, never needed to. Fluent in four other languages, not English. Uh, she never mentioned that the day the seance happened was her birthday, which was a traditional time for her and Harry to meet up every year. It was very important to both of them because it was the time they knew they would see each other all day. They would look forward to it all year. Never mentioned it during this very long speech that she wrote out through Jean Doyle. Um, it was very heartbreaking when Harry Houdini writes about it because all he wanted was to be able to talk to his mother and Jean Doyle dangled that in front of him and it was, it was nothing. Um, the more mediums that Harry Houdini contacted, the more he realized absolutely everything was fake. He could not find a shred of evidence and he desperately searched for it to his dying day. Um, in A Magician Among the Spirits, he has an entire chapter dedicated to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who he remained friends with after the whole seance incident. You can find a lot of public newspaper clippings about the two of them publishing things about each other. Um, but they were friends, even though one was staunchly literally the man who brought spiritualism to America, and the other was the man who dedicated his life to disproving false mediums. And their friendship is very fascinating. And honestly, I could do an entire talk just about their friendship, but I don't need to because like three people have written books about it. So go read those because it's so wild. Um, but this is a passage from that chapter about, about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which really lends its view to how Houdini felt about people who bought into spiritualism but we're not the people who were actively deceiving other people by pretending to be mediums or psychics or things like that. He said, Sir Arthur thinks I have great mediumistic powers and that some of my feats are done with the aid of spirits. Everything I do is accomplished by material means, humanly possible, no matter how baffling it is to the layman. He says that I do not enter a seance in the right frame of mind, that I should be more submissive, but in all the seances I have attended, I have never had a feeling of antagonism. I have no desire to discredit spiritualism. I have no warfare with Sir Arthur. I have no fight with the spiritists, but I do believe it is my duty for the betterment of humanity to place frankly before the public the results of my long investigation of spiritualism. I'm willing to be convinced my mind is open but the proof must be such as to leave no vestige of doubt that what is claimed to be done is accomplished only through or by supernatural power. So far, I have never on any occasion in all the seances I have attended seen anything which would lead me to credit a mediumistic performance with supernatural aid, nor have I ever seen anything which has convinced me that it is possible to communicate with those who have passed out of this life. Therefore, I do not agree with Sir Arthur. <laughs> I think it's very fun that he wrote that whole chapter and the whole seance happened and they were still friends. Um, but after he died, Sir Arthur did kind of get back at him with his own writings, which we'll cover in the end. But he makes it very clear throughout the book and throughout all of his teachings that he has no quarrel with anyone who has been deceived by mediums. His quarrel is with the mediums doing the deceiving. And part of his book, A Magician Among the Spirits, specifically lays out step by step how some of the most common deceptions are performed. So spirit photography was one of the ways uh, that they would get people. And so here you can see he made his own spirit photography with a portrait of Shakespeare and some other long dead fellows there in the back. 
there's also a really fun picture of him reading the Constitution to Abraham Lincoln, all made by spirit photography, disproving it. This, a lot of seances happen in the dark, so a lot of the sleight of hand was hard to detect in the low lighting. So a lot of his pictures just have exactly what's happening. If you could see the whole picture, apparently passing things over the tops of ladies' heads because they couldn't feel it with the hat on was a popular practice. Uh, so here he is demonstrating how that would work. Uh, there's quite a few photographs in there. They're very fun. Uh, Bess appears in a lot of them. They were a real tag team, cool little duo there. Uh, great marriage, lovely people. <clears throat> uh, in the introduction to Magician Among the Spirits, he elaborates on how sort of the pity he feels for the people uh, who have been deceived by spiritualist mediums and really the empathy that he has. He said, I have read with keen curiosity the articles by leading scientists on the subject of psychic phenomena, particularly those by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sir Oliver Lodge. Those were the two Englishmen who brought spiritualism over from England in which they have discussed their respective conversations to a belief in communication with the dead. There is no doubt in my mind that some of these scientists are sincere in their belief, but ultimately it is through that very sincerity that thousands become converts. The fact that they are scientists does not endow them with an especial gift for detecting the particular sort of fraud used by mediums, nor does it bar them from being deceived, especially when they are fortified in their belief by grief the various books and records of the subject are replete with deception practiced on noted scientists who have essayed to investigate prominent mediums. It is perfectly rational to suppose that I may be deceived once or twice by a new illusion, but if my mind, which has been so keenly trained for years to invent mysterious effects can be deceived, how much more susceptible must the ordinary observer be? And that's one of the main things that the mediums played on was the grief that was being felt by people. And Houdini references this time and again, when your mind is in mourning or in grief, you become desperate and you're more willing to believe things because you want them to be so. I think a lot of this was probably influenced by the own grief that he felt when his mother died. And it should be noted that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle lost his son in World War I and seven other members of his family to the Spanish flu. So he was racked with grief. It's only natural, as Houdini says, that he would be more easily susceptible to people who are giving him something that he wants to hear. And I think you see this a lot, even to this day, in shows like Long Island Medium, where, what's her name, Teresa Caputo goes around. And every time she preys on people who are experiencing loss of some sort, and so they're more susceptible to hearing what they want to hear, that their loved one is okay, that they've passed on, that they're doing well. If you read Phineas Speaks, which is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's book, all the messages that he gets from beyond the grave are messages of hope and happiness. They're all mediums telling him, hey, we're okay, we're fine, we're together, we're happy. And that's what people want to hear, and that's why they were so susceptible. Now, Houdini went to Congress because he wrote a bill, H.R. 8989, which would impose a $250 fine or six months in prison for any person pretending to tell fortunes for reward or compensation in Washington, D.C. This was a very big bill, and there was a lot of hoopla around it. Um, you can see him here in the in Congress, and there is a bunch of mediums behind him because they all rallied together to stop this bill from happening uh, because they were all like, um, no, we're real actually, please stop this. He had a lot of enemies because of his war against mediums because, you know, trying to take away people's bread and butter. Uh, there's a really good Atlas Obscura article about this and I have pulled sections from it, but uh, the whole article is worth reading. It's, they have a lot more photos, it's very fascinating. To prove that Capitol Hill was corrupted by psychic influence, Houdini quoted statements that his opponent, Madame Marcia, made to an incognito Rose Mackenberg the previous day, 
Now, Rose Mackenberg was one of several investigators that Houdini hired to go to cities before he got there and root out the mediums and get them to say things to his investigators that he could later bring up and prove were false. Marcia said a number of senators were coming to her readings. In fact, most of the senators, almost all the people in the White House believed in spiritualism. If politicians, supposedly the nation's best and brightest minds, were vulnerable to such delusions, then psychics were not just innocent fun, they posed a serious threat to democracy. The room erupted into chaos as Mackenberg proceeded to name names. Senders Capper, Watson, Dill, Fletcher. Houdini theatrically underscored her claim. The corruption went all the way to the top. Taking this case to Washington was especially masterful. Houdini started at the top by outing elected officials with lasting repercussions for the role of faith in American politics. Some beliefs, the mainstream kind, are still mandatory to prove a candidate's moral character. But believing in less conventional forms of supernatural agency, like clairvoyance or astrology, is a serious liability. In 1988, when President Reagan's former chief of staff publicly outed his boss for using the predictions of an astrologer, an international controversy erupted. It was seen as an embarrassment and a security risk. But the fears and criticisms leveled against the Reagans were right out of Houdini's anti-spiritualist playbook. So if you'll remember, this is a couple years after Houdini toured the country lecturing and he wasn't seeing the kind of momentum that he was hoping for, which is why he made this power play to go straight to the top. And he actually set off a security incident with part of this involving um, Madam Marsha, I guess, predicted the previous president's death and the current president was rumored to be using her. Houdini brought this up and he was like banned from the White House. That was a whole political scandal, which you can read about in the article. But his main purpose here was to say, hey, a lot of people, when you bring up the fact that they're touting things with no scientific backing, will say, hey, just let people have fun. It's just fun. They're not hurting anyone. But this was a way to show people that innocent fun often does have lasting repercussions and things that we say, you know, whatever, let people have their beliefs, etc. It's not as small scale as that. If you let deception and mistruth in, it can only have wider repercussions. Now let's talk about Houdini's legacy because he did die later that year, unfortunately. He did not die because he was punched in the stomach, by the way. Look that up. That's a cool thing. That's a common myth. He was punched in the stomach but it was playfully and lightly and did not lead to his death. So Sir Arthur Conan Doyle published several things about Houdini after his death, uh, but the longest piece by far was published the year after his death. And it's basically just a huge essay in which Sir Arthur Conan Doyle posits, Houdini was actually a medium. He was a medium the whole time and he didn't know it. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle knew it though and now he can prove it. Not that Houdini's dead, so he can't refute anything. Uh, his like gotcha paragraph in Houdini the Enigma, which is the title of this very long essay, which is published in two parts. Um, he says, is it possible for a man to be a very powerful medium all his life, to use that power continually, and yet never to realize that the gifts he is using are those which the world calls mediumship if that be indeed possible, then we have a solution of the Houdini enigma. Now, among other things that are ridiculous about this, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who died very soon after this. So who knows who, what else he would have talked about. But Houdini was actually in the process of publishing several volumes explaining most of his tricks. So we know today that we don't know how Houdini did a lot of the things he did. But he was planning on telling people. He was writing books. We have the first draft of the first book about this. He didn't want to keep it a secret. He didn't want people to think he was a medium. He wanted them to think he was a really good magician. And he would have been able to prove that to the world if he hadn't died so early, which is so unfortunate. But uh, part of his enduring open-mindedness is he had a pact with 14 people, including himself, that if any of them died, they all had secret codes to communicate with each other from beyond the grave. 
So his personal assistant died a year before him, a year or two before him. And he went to tons of seances, never heard from the guy with his secret code. And he says in one of his books, like if anyone would have been able to come through the grave and give me that message, it would have been this guy, my best friend, my personal assistant. Sadly, he never came through. So, you know, and then when Houdini died, he had a super secret code only known by his wife, Bess. So every year on the anniversary of his death, she would hold a public seance. After the first ones were private and then it got public after that. To be fair, she needed money and she was trying to sell a movie right, so good for her. And they would try to communicate with Houdini. They used all the biggest, brightest names in mediumship around and absolutely no one, he never came through. Uh, so they did the biggest one ever on the 10th anniversary of his death. Uh, they set it up on the top of a hotel. The Everyone came, it was a huge party. There had actually been two other magicians who died that same year. So they called on all three of them. Uh, no one came through, obviously. And so uh, this was her final thing that she said on the conclusion of the 10th annual seance. Houdini did not come through. My last hope is gone. I do not believe that Houdini can come back to me or to anyone. After faithfully following through the Houdini 10-year compact, after using every type of medium and seance, it is now my personal and positive belief that spirit communication in any form is impossible. I do not believe that ghosts or spirits exist. The Houdini shrine burned for 10 years. I now reverently turn out the light. It is finished. Good night, Harry. And to this day, we've had a couple other magicians follow in Houdini's footsteps. James Randi is pretty famous. He was directly inspired by Houdini. Um, he's pretty antagonistic though. Well, he was, RIP. Um, and he directly inspired Penn and Teller. They've often said that they were directly inspired by him. They're also kind of jerks about it. Um, Dorothy Dietrich and Dick Brooks uh, were direct descendant disciples of Houdini. Um, when Beth stopped doing her seances, she instructed one of her friends that if he wanted to keep doing them, that's fine. You know, she just didn't want any more of it. So he kept doing it and then he passed it on to Dorothy Dietrich and Dick Brooks. So they hold a seance every year to contact Houdini. He never comes through, obviously. And they personally have taken it upon themselves to expose fake mediums as well. They're also responsible for cleaning up his grave, which was left to ruin. Um, but I think there are a lot of things we can take away from Houdini's views towards spiritualism and especially his uh, empathy and open-mindedness. A lot of the time, it can be easy to fall back on anger when we see people who are getting ripped off or who believe in things that are obviously scientifically impossible. But I think he sets a very good example for approaching those sorts of topics with empathy foremost, instead of saying, you're such an idiot for believing this. Obviously this isn't true, there's no proof. Think like, how desperate would I have to be to have the scientific knowledge I have and still want to believe something like this. And I think especially within Sunday Assembly, I hope that we're the type of community that pushes that sort of forward empathy, even if we understand this is complete BS, this is completely fake, still approaching the people who have those beliefs with empathy and humanity above everything else. And I think that's the legacy he would want to continue after he died. That's all I've got. Um, if anyone has questions, I did a lot of research about this, so hit me up. Good job. All right, so any uh, Q&A portion parts in the chat? What's up, Austin? So how how did he actually die if it wasn't a punch in the stomach? It was a viral infection. Okay. Yeah, very boring. Can, can we just maintain that he died from a punch in the stomach? Because that tells that it goes for a much better storytelling than viral infection. But the student who punched him was blamed for his death for years afterward, and it drove him into a deep depression. So like 
Sorry, guy. Oops, sorry we blamed you. We didn't have modern medicine. Whoops. <laughs> Was your question? Oh, I was just going to add, I, I actually know a little bit about Arthur Conan Doyle's spirituality because I got really interested in the Cottingley fairies. I don't know if anyone, but I, there was like this movie that I watched as a kid about the Cottingley fairies. Um, I forget the name of it, but um, basically these uh, sisters took photos, photos of fairies, um, Cottingley, and it's like this. Um, oh. They took these photos of um, fairies in their backyard, um, five photos, and um, they were 16 and nine years old. And then the photos came to the attention of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who used them to illustrate the existence of fairies in his book. And of course, these were not real fairies. These girls had just taken photos with like little paper fairies. Um, and then like this thing just blew up <laughs> on them because uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was like, yes, these are real, and these poor girls just made it up. Uh, so that was a whole thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Houdini actually disproved these photos, um, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he even got to see that they were fakes, uh, but then someone sent Sir Arthur Conan Doyle other fairy photos, and he was like, these are the real thing, gotta show Houdini, sent them to Houdini. He was like, you can't argue with this, the real thing. I got it this time. Fairies are still real. Um, Houdini did disprove it, but he didn't want to hear it. Also, there's an anecdotal story that once Houdini did the like thumb trick in a cab for Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, blew his mind. He mentioned it in two letters. He was like, that was the most astounding trick I've ever seen. I was like, sir, I know five-year-olds who see through that. So like <laughs> the man who wrote Sherlock Holmes was maybe not the genius we thought he was <laughs> i mean he also didn't love writing sherlock holmes and the fandom that <laughs> i know so wild okay i see tony has a question well it's something late i'm coming in from manchester in the uk and i was misinformed about the start time so i only caught the last 15 minutes but you mentioned penn and teller i wonder i just wonder if you know if penn and teller have reenacted any classic houdini tricks in their um stage act I actually have no idea because I did not look into his magician career at all. I'm assuming they have because I feel like that's really up their alley. Um, also, they're not friends in real life is a weird thing that I learned about them when I was researching this, but they're the godparents of each other's children, which seems weird if you're not friends. But whole other thing. If someone wants to do a knowledge sharing session about Houdini's magic, would love to sit in on that because I did not even have enough time to delve into that, but oh, so good. Yeah, I remember seeing uh, an interview with uh, uh, with Penn Gillette, because obviously Teller doesn't talk, but Penn, uh, he, he said one of the reasons why Penn, uh, Teller and I have been able to maintain our friendship over the decades is because we're not actual friends. We're just business partners. We don't we call each other on our birthdays and that's about it. And first time I heard that, I, cause I always loved Penn and Teller. I was like, no, 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 no. You, you're, you're magicians. You're not supposed to reveal the trick. You're supposed to keep telling us that you're the best of friends. Maybe I'm biased. Maybe the real friendship was the trick along the way. <laughs> Could be. All right, so anybody else? Nope, all right. Let's move on. Let's see. Oops, sorry. All right. So we got our monthly address. Uh, I'll pass it over to our uh, president pending our next election, uh, Austin Edwards. Yes, yeah, I was gonna say, actually before the monthly address, um, CJ, you had mentioned that you'd uh, looked it up quite a lot. Are there any resources you'd be willing to share with people or like a list or something? Maybe you could put on like the event after or something like that? Yeah, honestly, if you just go to archive.org um, and put in Houdini, like all of his works are uh, available now to read. And he also had the largest collection of spiritualism and medium like 
paraphernalia, which was donated to the Library of Congress on his death. And that's all available for free on the web as well. If you just go to the Library of Congress website. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so of course, uh, new year, hopefully uh, better uh, <laughs> better situations this year. Hopefully we get to, to see the end of the pandemic with the vaccine coming out um, and hopefully be able to start meeting in person. So that'd be great. I think that we've really taken this time uh, over the past, what, like nine months has it been now or something like that to kind of fortify ourselves. Um, and uh, kind of regroup, get a good strong uh, leadership base and, uh, and even a, a good funding base too. So um, I'm hoping that we can take those and move forward with um, really awesome programming uh, this year. And uh, we've, we're really, we're getting a very um, uh, good, uh, good momentum. Everyone's uh, putting in events and stuff like that. I'm trying to find our post, sorry, so that I can show you. What is it? Uh, oh, I'm not trying to show people the, the events coming. Oh, here it is, right here it is. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. So uh, one thing I wanted to mention um, is that we're trying to get as much feedback from um, our members as possible. So let me share this link with you. We're having our voting um, over the next uh, like week, I think is, is left. So we already had uh, for like a week of voting. Um, so if you could go in and just, uh, just vote, it's, it's pretty much one person, one position, but, uh, the more feedback we get from, from our, our base, the more it kind of legitimates the people in power now. Um, so <clears throat> if you could go through and, uh, and just, uh, do your, your voting, I actually haven't voted yet, um, but I'll, I'll do that right after this. So, uh, pretty quick three minutes. So it's not, not so bad. So, um, yeah, if you could do that, then we'll, we'll have official, uh, members, we actually haven't voted in a while, so this will be a, a way for us to finally have memberships have a say in who's who's in leadership and everything like that. And uh, I think it'll it'll really set us up to, to kind of launch launch forward as we go throughout the year. Um, I don't really have much else. I hope that we can finally start seeing you guys in, in person because um, online is fine, but I know everyone's kind of got Zoom fatigue, so but. We'll try to have a couple uh, social distance things this year. Uh, we actually had one member suggest going sledding. So as long as uh, it actually snows enough to sled here in Michigan and Detroit, <laughs> uh, then that could be a pretty fun thing. So, uh, but but keep your eyes out or keep your keep your eyes open, um, and you'll 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 see what we're putting out there. So, and of course, invite your friends. So uh, that's pretty much all I had. Anthony, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. All right, so we are a nonprofit organization and we are all here voluntarily. Uh, we do everything out of our goodness of our heart, but things do cost money. So we do appreciate any donations that uh, you can send in. Uh, if you can make it on a regular basis, we'll love you even more, but even a one-time payment will be great. And you can do it on many, many different platforms from uh, Amazon Smile to PayPal. You can go directly to our website, sundayassemblydetroit.org. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at Meetup and we appreciate anything. We do have upcoming events. Uh, first, we have to work hard, then we get to play hard. So tomorrow night, we do have an assembly committee meeting and anybody's welcome to attend, uh, give feedback or suggestions. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad idea. And then we have a leadership meeting the following Monday, uh, also gonna be via Zoom. And then we get to have some fun with things like uh, Wine with Ted, which right now we are still doing online, but eventually we're going to get back to doing it in person. If you're not familiar with this, when we do it in person, it's a great thing. We go to somebody's house, we drink, we uh, watch some videos, and then we slowly walk away before we have to do any cleanup. No, I'm kidding. We, we always clean up. Game night, always a popular thing. We like to change things up and uh, join us online for that one. We have book club for the readers. And we're gonna finish it off today with 
life will happen. Uh, we talked about things that are going on in our lives and what things we plan to do in the future. Um, for those of you who know me, who were uh, participating in our uh, meetings throughout the summer, you saw I was working on the outside of my house. Now I'm working on the inside of my house. So I'm going to be redoing parts of my kitchen, my bedroom, and my daughter's bedroom. So that's what it's going on in my life. I know, kind of boring. That's called adulting. And if anybody would like to share what they'll be going on, raise your hand and I'll uh, start with Austin. So um, I was talking with uh, CJ quite a lot about uh, her worm uh, obsession lately and it really got me into it. So I read- Yeah, he actually dreamed about worms last night. I did dream about worms last night. Yes. Welcome to the worm dream, baby. <laughs> It was Professor McGonagall. It was really weird. Anyways, <laughs> um, so I read through the entire book and I'm actually in devising plans to buy um, like a worm composting bin to put in the basement. So hopefully that will keep me from throwing away, it looks like roughly four or five pounds of food every week. And that'll be cool to make, um, um, make, uh, make good fertilizer for a garden that I also plan to do. Not within the next month, but uh, I'll keep you guys updated on that. Um, there, uh, speaking of gardening, uh, my uh, mom, Yvonne, is going to be doing a talk, a knowledge sharing session talk um, also at the end of this month about um, starting your garden for the year. So uh, I grew up, we always had uh, lights and growing seeds in our very small house. <laughs> It was just like something that happened every year and it was just it was just such a normal thing for me. Um, but I realized that not everyone knows that you have to do that and stuff like that for certain things like tomatoes and things like that if you want to get those going. So she's going to kind of tell you about that, tell you about some raised beds, um, some stuff about the soil and stuff. So I'm sure some of you are very experienced gardeners, but for those who aren't and want to know a little bit um, or those who want to refresh your, uh, that's a really good one. And then speaking on the book club, super quick book takes like two hours to listen to. So it's, it's gotta be even faster to read. Um, I loved it, absolutely loved Pygmalion. It was hilarious and I'm not usually a fiction guy, but that was really, I really appreciated the, the, the dry witty humor of that book. So if, uh, if you haven't come to book club yet, or if you're in book club and haven't read it yet, don't worry, it's very quick and it's an awesome book. So I, I really am excited to talk about that when we come uh, to that towards the end of the month. So that was my life, life will happen. Sorry for a lengthy one. I have a worm bin already set up. I can get you because I do not have worms yet, but I did make them a whole little nice habitat. And then the worm drama happened. I wanted to rebrand myself as like the worm person, but now I don't have any worms. So I'm just the person with a worm bin and no worms. <laughs> um, my life will happen is obviously I'm going to start a new job. But also on kind of a bummer note, um, my birthday is next month and this will be the first year that I don't have a party in my whole 27 years of existence. So I'm having like a huge mental breakdown about that. <laughs> um, so if you talk to me, don't mention my birthday because I will get really sad. All right, anybody else care to share anything that they... Uh, Just like Zach's, Zach's got his hand raised. Oh, does he? Go yeah. ahead, Zach. Oh, we can't hear you. St nope, still can't hear you. One minute. No. Nah. You're unmuted, but I think maybe your computer is muted. Never mind. Okay. Well, if you get it to work out. You can also think, type it. I think you slider. might just need to tilt your microphone down. Oh, that's true. Oh, no, I didn't mention the book. Reading. It's called Worms Eat My Garbage, and CJ recommended it. <laughs> uh, Zach, you can also type it into the, uh, the sidebar here, too, and you can share it that way. Yeah, cool. It uh, looks like that's what he's doing. You know, give a second. I got the like 35, 35th year edition of the Worms Eat My Garbage. Yeah, that's the good one. Uh, the lady who wrote it's from Kalamazoo too, so. 
<clears throat> She's dead now, but she was from Kalamazoo. Welcome, Zach. Thank you. I'm glad you were able to, to make it. I know we talked uh, on Meetup a bunch of comments, so that was awesome. Glad you could be here. Oh, this talk about worms just reminds me of uh, that scene from uh, Dumb and Dumber. We're saving our money to open a worm store. I got worms. That's what we're going to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like uh, Tony has his hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, um, hi everyone. Really, first time I've joined, but I am one of the co-organisers of the Manchester Sunday Assembly. Uh, we've been online every week since the first lockdown in March. Um, but I'm also um, a lecturer, an English lecturer in a college, uh, 16 to 17 year old. So in terms of life will happen, we've been told that we're going to be teaching remotely for the next few months and that there won't be any exams at the end of it all. So I've been teaching for 32 years and I, I thought I'd seen everything. But <laughs> the, the last month has told me that I haven't seen everything, that I'm having to kind of relearn a totally new way of doing things. <laughs> Yeah, you guys are on what lockdown number four at this point? I have a lot of friends in the UK and I feel like every time I turn around, there's a, just a new one. Yeah, I mean, we've never really been out of lockdown. It's just that they've got this tier system that's been kind of eased, but it's on the maximum now. We're on higher figures than at any other time during the peak of the previous lockdown in terms of number of deaths and uh, people contracting it. So um, yeah, it's uh, Boris Johnson's optimistic about schools and colleges going back in the middle of February. I think it's going to be at least three more months with it. A lot depends on this vaccine, as you said over there. Um, so yeah, it's uh, very strange times. <laughs> so you said no no evaluations at the end of it? Like there's no final exam, no nothing like that? No, so the, the difficulty now, we had one term from September to December, so I've got a certain amount of work that I could base a teacher grade on, but nowhere near enough to give a really robust grade. So we really need to get back in. There's going to be no real exams, but obviously we could hit them with mock exams and, uh, and use that as our uh, basis. But it's anybody's guess at the moment. It, the, the virus will decide what happens next. Yeah, well, I, know, what... oh. I was just going to say, I know in our area, a lot of the um, senior living facilities are starting to get vaccinations. Lynn and George, I'm glad to hear that you guys are on the list for it too. Um, so hopefully it makes its movements and we're still on the over 90s and, and the NHS key workers. There's, there's about 10 different groups. Some, somebody's calculated that I'm probably in group six, which means I probably won't get a vaccination until about June. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm not expecting any massive changes anytime soon. I didn't realize how confusing it was for schools fully until I started with my new job. And they're like, yeah, you're going to be at the college, maybe in person, maybe not. And I was like, I start in two weeks and they're like we'll see and I'm like how are students dealing with this how I would have a mental breakdown <laughs> yeah my brother's in his first semester of college this year and he'd been planning to live in the dorms so like he has been assigned a dorm and like his roommates but they've never been able to to get in because the college decided to be remote the first year and it's a whole confusing time because my parents are going to become foster parents and they've been planning this out since be like pre-pandemic and now like their plan was for my brother to be in school and then they would have foster kids so that my brother wouldn't be like disturbed during his studies and stuff by these other kids in the house but now that's not going to quite happen that way <laughs> so it's a very confusing time for students yeah we're using um outlook teams which is quite similar to zoom and um I, if i've got a group of 24 teenagers they all have the cameras off there might be about four or five putting stuff in the chat box about three or four of them will send me work. One of my colleagues said it's a bit like a seance because she just sits there going, is anybody there? Can anybody hear me? <laughs> All right. So I hope everybody had a great time uh, this morning and I hope to see everybody uh, at our next uh, Sunday assembly, which is going to be February 14th. Uh, and of course, like I said, we do have a lot of events in between then uh, we can partake in and uh, you can join us anytime. So uh, with that, just say have a great Sunday. Everybody stay safe and take care. <laughs>